In this video, I'm going to describe the physical geography of North Africa and the Middle East by focusing in on key landform features created via plate tectonics. Here we have a physical relief map of North Africa and the Middle East. And so inside the yellow line is our region. What I have is the dash yellow lines to the left or to the west of that line is North Africa and to the east or to the right of that dash line is the Middle East. Egypt is kind of that in between. Some say it's part of the Middle East, some say it's North Africa. So that's what the lines mean. What we got going on in North Africa and the Middle East, which makes it kind of unique, is the fact we have all three of those plate boundaries that we've mentioned beforehand. We've got convergence. So we've got plates colliding with each other. We've got divergence. We got plates spreading apart from each other. But we also have just a small instance, but an instance of plates kind of sliding by each other, those transform fault boundaries. Now we're gonna do the plate tectonic history of North Africa and the Middle East. So 260 million years ago, once again, this is where our good friend Pangaea, the one supercontinent which most of the world's continents were all together, centered around Africa, and of course, North Africa is going to be attached to Africa. And so all was centered on this one particular supercontinent 260 million years ago that started to break up, that started to separate soon after. What we have is inside this yellow box, me trying to approximate the, uh, you know, the relative location of North Africa in the Middle East. So we can kind of keep in mind its plate tectonic history. So 220 million years ago, much of this area wasn't even above water. It was essentially uh, not there, it hasn't been formed yet. Uh, much of North Africa, in fact, was underwater. Um, so we can see that here. And now, 50 million years after Pangaea, uh, we can see a sea, a separation between those two landmasses, Gondwana to the south and Laurasia to the north. And so once again, much of this area is underwater. Now, if you look in the left-hand corner of the yellow box, you can start to see the Sahara Desert and what will become uh, the shape of much of northern Africa. Now, if you've been following along all semester, the continents are starting to take their shape. And so now we're starting to see South America break off from Africa. So Northern America and Europe have already started to break off of North Africa. Very important, we're gonna come back to this, but the Atlas Mountains, they've kind of formed a few different times from a few different pump, bumps, bumping and grindings, from a, a few different plate play collisions, one of which being way back when, when North America and North Africa were actually together. Um, so before they separate, they're bumping and grinding, creating uh, the Atlas Mountains, but also creating uh, the Appalachian Mountains. But then over time, the separation, which we can see here just to the, uh, the left of the yellow box, separating North America from uh, North Africa and the African continent happening uh, well into 120 million years ago. It's been happening way longer than that. We continue on once again, the theme, the Middle East and North Africa for much of this time so far has majority of it been underwater. Now what we can see here also 90 million years ago before we get going too much is first off the Sahara Desert, you could actually go from north of what is present day Africa to, uh, to Equatorial Africa and the Atlantic Ocean just by going through North Africa and the Sahara Desert. Well, what would become the Sahara Desert? Uh, so actually in the bottom left of that yellow box, you can see you can go right through Africa uh, from the north and work your way to, this, to the western part. Uh, and so that's, that's one thing to note. Also inside that yellow box, you should see a lot of these kind of these thin uh, little, let's say little rugged islands uh, that are poking up uh, in this mostly, uh, mostly blue area of, of water and seas. And so what those are, those are just essentially plate colliding. And so those plate collisions is happening enough of an uplift in which we're seeing that uplift and those plates colliding, poking up above the water surface. Now those will later become very important when we look at this area is very, very rugged. Well, we're gonna see that, well, this area has been rugged for a long time. So before we see more land uh, coming through and, and dominating this area, we already see it's quite rugged. Now, by 65 million years ago, that gap I was telling you about in North Africa is closed. Uh, 
Uh, so it's starting to close up uh, even farther like a zipper. Uh, but the Arabian Peninsula is still attached to the continent of Africa. Uh, so the Arabian Peninsula hasn't separated yet uh, from North Africa, but still nonetheless, we see the closing of much of that water area inside this yellow box and it's becoming more land as the African plate comes plowing into, or actually more is what's going on is the Eurasian plates coming plowing into a relatively stable African plate. Now it's a 35 million years ago, uh, if you're following along North Africa, we can see it's now mostly desert. Uh, we can also see the Arabian Peninsula and what would become uh, you know, much of the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, and all of that's underwater or, or very, you know, barely uh, above water. In the case, maybe in a really rugged terrain, but nonetheless, in that top right-hand corner or the northeast corner of that yellow box, which will become Iran and Turkey and all of that, very, very, very rugged already. And we continue on 20 million years ago, and we're starting to see separation of the Arabian Peninsula breaking off of North Africa, which now we can see the Arabian Peninsula has now been separated from the Red Sea and separated from Africa and the African plate until we get to today. Now, knowing our plate tectonic history, this particular region, let's zoom in a little bit farther and try to understand some landforms created from these plate tectonic boundaries. And to do so, we have to understand who, who and what are the key plates, uh, the key players in this uh, tectonic active area. So the green plate is the Eurasian plate. Uh, the yellow plate is the Arabian plate. And uh, the salmon colored uh, plate is the African plate. So what we've got going on here is in some cases, we've got uh, arrows separating from each other as we do with the Arabian plate and the African plate. So we have separation happening here for sure. But the salmon colored is colliding with the green colored. So we definitely have plate convergence as well. Further, the yellow plates also colliding with the green plate. Uh, so we have a head-on collision there. And so we also have plate collision there. And so we have arrows uh, that should be on this map. Uh, I didn't make the map. Uh, that should be there uh, coming into each other uh, in those particular areas I mentioned. Now let's take a look at some of these plate boundaries. And so the red line, the solid red line that we see is a convergent plate boundary. Uh, this uh, teal uh, kind of dashed line uh, that we see in the Red Sea and over there, the kind of the right-hand side of the picture, that is a, a divergent plate boundary. So that's where we're going to have plate separation occurring. And I tried to further emphasize that using those yellow arrows. Now let's get really excited and take a look at some of these plate tectonic collisions, starting with the Atlas Mountains, where we have the Eurasian plate colliding with the African plate. And what do you know? Along that plate boundary, so in a kind of a very similar shape, uh, kind of parallel to that red line I showed beforehand is the Atlas Mountains. So Atlas Mountains is where we see uh, one of the famous countries in this, in this particular area is the country of Morocco. We can see just across uh, from the Mediterranean from Spain in the Iberian Peninsula and Europe. Also, what we should note here is we can see, once again, the role of orographic precipitation. Orographic precipitation, if you haven't been with us a whole semester, on one side of the mountain, it's quite lush and green. Essentially what happens is the moisture is lifted because of the mountain. It eventually condenses, becomes too heavy to be carried and held aloft. And so that water, uh, which was previously vapor or essentially the in the air, becomes actually a liquid that we can see, falls back down as rain, and creates a green side of the mountain, where on the other side, it's quite dry. So in the case of the Atlas Mountains, I hope we can see on one side it's green, and on the other side it's brown. So on the north side, we get that orographic precipitation, and then on the south side, or the interior, or the Sahara Desert side of the Atlas Mountains, we get the rain shadow effect. Now let's go to where we have more plate collision boundaries over here, where we have the Eurasian plate colliding with the Arabian plate. We should expect along this plate convergence boundary, this red line, we should expect to find a mountain range running parallel to it. 
And what do you know we do? The Zagros Mountain Range. The Zagros Mountain Range goes right along this, plate, uh, this uh, collision between the Arabian Plate on one side and the Eurasian Plate on the other side. The Zagros Mountains are very important for a few different reasons, and I'll come back to those later in this chapter. But if we look at Iran. That's essentially what we're staring at. Yeah, I know that the country borders aren't on here, but if you notice the case of Iran, first off, it's quite dry, but it's also, it's quite rugged. Uh, so part of it being isolated in many respects from the rest of the world is it has a lot of these isolated pockets and these isolated parts, which makes it kind of complex. And so that's something that we're going to come back to uh, later on in this chapter. But I just want to emphasize how this area is it's very, very rugged. And it's rugged because it's along a plate convergent boundary. And it's been that way for a long, long time. Beyond the plate convergent boundary, we also have other chains of mountains. And I'm not going to go into the nuances of how they form, but the moral of the story is the Eurasian plate and the Arabian plate have been colliding with each other for a while. And so from a previous collision or kind of a, a residue of a previous collision are the Caucasus Mountains and the Albors or the Elbers, the Albers. Uh, they're called different things, mountains uh, in Iran. Now, if we zoom in and take a little closer look at these two different mountain ranges, the Caucasus Mountains in the north and the Albers Mountains to the south in this particular image, uh, we can see orographic precipitation. Let's go ahead and go to the easier one, the Albors. And so the Albors, we can very clearly see orographic precipitation. So on one side of that dashed white line, which is trying to represent the summit or the peaks of this mountain range, on the north side or the Caspian Sea side, that water body, we can see it's green, it's lush. And so we have the wet side of the mountain range. And in the interior, much of the Iranian interior or the south side of that summit, we can see it's quite dry, the rain shadow effect. And so in the case of this particular area, the wind patterns, they come from the north. They come from the north. They come over the Caspian Sea where they pick up some moisture and then they get lifted by the mountain range and then dump that rain onto, in this case, uh, the northern side of the Albors mountain range. When we go to the Caucasus Mountains, well, you can see, well, it looks like it's pretty lush on both sides. And so it actually has this kind of advantageous position in which of where the water bodies are located, it gets orographic precipitation on both sides. Uh, so a little bit more on on one side, depending on where you're other on the, if you're on the, uh, the, the western side of the Caucasus, it's maybe a little bit more on the southern side. And if you're on the uh, the eastern sides, maybe a little bit more on the northern side as far as where that moisture is coming from. But nonetheless, you can see it's green on both sides and it's getting orographic precipitation from the dominant wind patterns, kind of bringing in moisture on both sides of the mountain. Kind of an interesting uh, pattern there. Next up, we have divergent plate boundaries. And so those that teal dashed line is trying to represent areas where we have separation. So essentially the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden are essentially have been formed rather recently by separation. So these plates are separating from each other. Actually, actually very linear looking features. I mean, you can kind of see that these shapes quite clearly. The Red Sea, how it kind of has this very thin, narrow strip. And the Gulf of Aden is also kind of thin and, and thin and narrow. It's just essentially that, uh, right there along that, uh, that, that, that teal line is where the plates are separating. The land masses are separating. What's coming in to then fill that gap? The oceans, waterways. And so thus these are becoming seas or gulfs or whatever. And so these are actually, like I said, relatively new waterways, but they're only going to get bigger and bigger over time as the plates, these diversion plates, continue to separate farther and farther from each other. But even further, we've got a transform fault boundary. And so if we look at this particular area, if we zoom in, I've already mentioned the blue line, the solid blue line, which is the separation, the diversion plate boundary that goes right through the Red Sea and continues up. Uh, we also have the, the solid red line, I already mentioned that, the convergent plate boundary. But this black, blue dashed line in this case, this plate boundary is actually representative of a transform fault. Now, I know I mentioned earlier in the semester, in the chapter one, I talked about plate tectonics and transform faults, how you have plates going opposite directions, kind of sliding by each other or transform faults. 
you can also have plates that are sliding by each other even when they're going the same direction. Just think about a highway. Think about the person that's 90 years old in which their turn signal's been blinking since 1932, that's sitting there in their right-hand lane, and then you've got the person who's 18 years old texting and driving, going at 100 miles per hour in the left-hand lane. They're going the same direction, obviously one going faster than the other. And so the same thing going on here. So we have two different sides of this plate boundary one moving faster than the other. So if we go ahead, where do, where might this area be? This is actually where Israel is. And so Israel is actually kind of getting separated and it's gonna slowly but surely move at a different rate and get kind of uh, uh, moved past uh, from much of the rest of the Middle East. And so imagine that, uh, the Middle East and Israel, which is kind of a splintered relationship, well, I'll give a few million years and it'll be completely split up in a completely different situation in which they might not even be connected at all because of plate tectonics. How cool is that? And here I have an aerial photograph that shows uh, that along that yellow line, you can kind of see that transform fault boundary. And so on the left side of that yellow dashed line, uh, the plate is moving slower. It's going the same direction. It's going north, it's going up. Uh, but on the right side, it's moving faster. And in some, I always like making sure to put in that topographic profile of a particular area. And so now we're looking from the south, uh, southwest, the A to the B, uh, to the northeast across this area. What is the cross section or the side view relatively? This is definitely a very much a generalization. This isn't specific as the topographic profile here. And so we have from North Africa going across the Nile River, uh, we see a kind of a rugged feature. Then we go down into the Red Sea. And so the Red Sea is where we see actually our lowest lying area. We got that separation occurring. And so what's coming in to fill the, fill the uh, gap of obviously water. Uh, the Arabian Desert, quite flat, but also one of the things people don't realize, uh, it does have a good amount of elevation to it. Uh, and it gently slopes down to the Tigris and the Euphrates River Valleys or the Persian Gulf in which it gently slopes down in two until we get to that convergent plate boundary that we've already mentioned. And that's the Zagros and the Elbers uh, and the uh, Caucasus Mountains and eventually the Caspian Sea.